Um, if you talk to our Native American partners from the Nine Dakota tribes, when they talk about the reintroduction is the return of a family member, you know, making that circle full again, bringing back that missing link. It has meaning also for people's culture, for people's connections to their environment. So I think it goes even much wider than just looking at the ecosystem when you, when you think about the communities that live around that area. Welcome to The Possibus. The Possibus is a podcast collaboration between the Smithsonian Earth Optimism and Pelicanus. The Smithsonian Conservation Commons Earth Optimism Initiative is changing the conservation narrative from one that focuses on problems and perils to highlighting impactful solutions. By celebrating what's working in conservation, they seek to inspire action and move global community from a sense of loss to one of hope and finding solutions to save our planet. Pelicanus is a conservation-based collective in continuous wonder of the healing and encouragement that is possible on this planet and the people making it happen. We are committed to telling these stories and demonstrating optimism through science. Now in this partnership, we spotlight conservationists working with a possibilistic attitude for solution-based efforts to tackle the world's critical environmental struggles. We're attempting to reframe the narrative around conservation to show that conservation successes are possible through changes in attitude and implementation of intentional change. In this episode of The Possibus, we talk to Dr. Hila Shimon. Dr. Shimon is a landscape ecologist and mammologist at Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute's Conservation Ecology Center. Shimon's research interests focus on anthropogenic activity and land use changes effects on terrestrial mammals distribution and densities across large landscape gradients. Today we talk about her work with the American bison and swift fox in and around Montana where she lives. She is doing so much amazing work for both species. So let's get to her telling us about these programs. Welcome to The Possibilist, Dr. Hila Shimon. Uh, it's very, we're very happy to have you, and we're very excited to talk to you about all your projects. Hi, right, nice to meet you. Good to see everybody. It's very nice to meet you as well. And, um, you know, I think we'll, we, we want to know everything about what you've been doing, because reading through your website and uh, the Smithsonian uh, articles about your work, it's, there's so much, and there's so much we could talk about, but I think a great place to start would be uh, for you to introduce yourself, and then um, and then maybe talk to us about Montana, because you're in the Montana region, correct? That is right, yeah. Yeah, and I've always wanted to go. I've never been. Um, it looks beautiful. They call it Big Sky for a reason, I think. <laughs> Can you uh, tell us about yourself, and then, and then just kind of describe your study sites? Yeah, absolutely. So... I guess I'll start by describing myself. What do I do or what I'm interested in? So I'm a landscape ecologist or conservation biologist, somewhere between that room. And I am very interested to understand how whole ecosystems work. So not just single species, just to think about all those different layers and to try to put that puzzle together and figure out all different mechanisms on how one thing could impact another how things can cascade through trophic levels. And before I moved to Montana, I worked in the Middle East in an area in Israel that is heavily populated and where wildlife and, and, and humans interact on a regular basis in a very, very intense way. But then was offered the amazing opportunity to move to Montana, to move to the US, take my family, my kids, my husband, and go explore this vast, new and exciting, huge landscape. So I moved to Bozeman, Montana, and my field site is actually about six hours away in uh, northeastern Montana, in the Northern Great Plains. Beautiful sea of grass and amazing sagebrush all over the place. The best places to see the grassland birds when they migrate, when they breed, so many ungulates all over the place, insects, the plants, everything is so beautiful. And I moved here in 2018 and was tasked to start developing a research program, which has developed beautifully, I think, uh, myself and my colleagues. And today I work on, I think, about a dozen different research projects that scale from you know, sound ecology, 
to wildlife reintroductions and restoration. So as Taylor mentioned, I, I'm a wildlife biologist, but here in Southern California, where it's pretty much the exact opposite of Montana. You know, there's like really small little preserves throughout Southern California, but everything else is just development. So the idea of Montana is, is uh, it's, for me, that's, the, that's, where you, that's where wildlife biologists go. You know, obviously there's plenty of wildlife biology work to do here, but it, it seems like it's, it's like this magical place. <laughs> Do you mind telling us a little bit about what kind of uh, species you work with? Um, I know that we're going to dig deep into the into the fox and maybe the bison and whatever, but do you mind describing that um, for the audience? Like what kind of interactions and what kind of species there are? Sure, no problem. Yeah, so like I said before, I, I work, my work is kind of spread out all over the place. So for example, I do work on soundscapes where I collect data, sound data on insects and amphibians and grass and birds. And I try to see how, you know, different diversity indices change in relation to different land use in the area. So different grazing impacts for the most part in Eastern Montana or different habitats. If it's a, the areas of Ponderosa forest or is it a grassland or maybe a shrubland, depending on where we sample. But then I also do a lot of work using camera traps, which I love that tool because you know you can just throw many of them in the field and collect data for months and months at a time, and really collect the data from like thousands of locations in about an area that's the size of about 5,000 square miles, which is huge. So you know all the data about the different ungulates that live in that place, so the pronghorn and the mule deer and the white-tailed deer, the elk. But then I also do work on different carnivores, mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes that occur in the landscape. Also reintroducing a carnivore that went missing about 50 years ago, the swift fox. And a lot of my work is also focused on how two main keystone species in the area impact other wildlife, so prairie dogs, and also bison. I've been work fortunate to work with an organization called American Prairie that brought back bison to the region after being gone for over 100 years, and also fortunate to work with the Fort Belknap Indian community where they reintroduced bison really in the 1970s. So have these really unique sites where you can start looking how bison manipulate the landscape and how that impacts other you know, wildlife groups. So with the, the, the bison, can you dive deep a little bit, dive a little bit deeper and tell us why the, the bison are important and what have you learned from the studies that you guys have performed? So I guess, we should talk a little bit about the history of bison, though I'm sure that many people know, but for those who don't, there used to be millions, tens of millions of bison all over North America. Um, so we're talking, especially around the Great Plains, so Saskatchewan, all the way down to Mexico. In the movement of these huge, huge herds manipulated the landscape and created that diversity that made microhabitats for other species. And we're talking about grasslands, so the grassland specialists. Areas of long grass or short grass, areas that are bare, creating grazing lawns that are also been used by bison and then other species as well. And then in the turn of the last century, they were gone. They were almost brought to extinction, right? We only had just a few animals left in the wild, I think 23 out in Yellowstone that were found in the middle of nowhere. But it's important to also note that they are making a comeback. And today there's about 500,000 bison across North America, 400,000 of them in production herds. And then the rest are scattered in conservation herds, which is a pretty small herds of just a few hundreds of individuals. And in Yellowstone, where they have a few thousand individuals, that's maybe the only place where we can actually see free roaming bison today that do uh, migration from high elevation to low elevation in the park. But 
we don't know a lot about them because they're gone, right? We don't know um, how they used to move really, how vast was their migrations? Were they only local? How much did they actually move? Today, we can only study them in confined environments. I would even argue that today we don't really have any wild bison, even though some of them are called wild, because their movements are constrained. They could only stay in Yellowstone Park, or they can only stay in the pasture at American Prairie or the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. But we could do, though, is to study them now and try to figure out what is the best way to manage them to have positive outcomes. The outcomes that we want to see, you know, the positive impacts on grass and birds or the positive impacts on the vegetation or the insects. And that is not an easy task. That is not an easy task because they are a herd species. They're fascinating, you know. It's, it's a huge family group. And when you look at a herd that has a few hundreds of individuals, you sort of start to tease apart the individuals in the group. You realize that there are small you know, family groups, individuals that have stronger bond, bonds between them. And they tend to move together most of the time. But then the herd does this weird things where it, they aggregate together into a few hundreds of individuals and then suddenly break apart into few tens, smaller groups, and then come together again. And it fluxes that fission fusion behavior. And we don't really know when this happens and why this happens and how does this behavior actually impact the vegetation that in turn will impact the other levels in that ecosystem. So I do have a pretty big study now together with um, Montana State University and a PhD student named Claire Bresnan, who's trying to, you know, tease apart those social bonds in the herd. So what she's doing is she's trying, she's drawing on all, you know, Smithsonian experts that we could tie into this project. So she's, she's doing behavioral ecology by going out and mapping the behavior of the, each individual in the herds. She's also tagging every individual in the herd, putting an ear tag with a GPS to try to see that insane movement of all of those individuals together. We're also collecting genetics from each individual so we can look at relatedness and try to figure out which individual is dominant and which individual is hanging out with whom. And then we're collecting data on the ground. So using, you know, collecting data on vegetation, collecting data with camera traps and other species that occur on these and then collecting data with audio recorders and trying to understand how bison are impacting other groups. So it's, you know, in a nutshell, there's been a lot of things that I compiled here. You can say that in this one project, there's hmm, multiple, really, multiple projects that fold into this study. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. As you mentioned, that's one of your 12 projects. <laughs> and there's probably 12 projects within that one project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, we don't have a whole lot of grassland communities in Southern California left. Um, I, I have a small little bits of experience with it here and there. I've taken some classes and done some work mostly on burrowing owls. And when you go to these places and you're so used to like a scrub habitat or like a riparian habitat and you go out there, you're like, all right, this is boring. It just looks like a grass field. But when you really get into it, like you're saying, it's so complex and actually more complex just at a scaled down level, but also scaled up because it's so, there can be so vast. And so, yeah, learning like uh, the bunch grasses that if you, if they aren't preyed upon, then they, they actually grow too big and then they die from the inside. But if they get preyed, preyed upon, then they actually flourish even better and they, they seed more and they, and then they last longer. It's, and it, that blew my mind. So I love everything you're just talking about. I don't really have a question. I just really like everything you just said. Um, what, I guess, what is the next steps? Like, what is the, the overall goal with the Smithsonian? Um, is there, is there a, an end goal? Is there trying, are you trying to get uh, back to the amount of bison that we had 200 years ago, 300 years ago, or is it kind of um, get as many as we can, or just like, let's get back those ecosystem services back into every area that we can. Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute is a science institute. We're researchers. So our job is to go out, research, and provide information, evidence-based studies that later land managers, 
advocates, whoever needs it, can use that data for whatever goal. Our goal is, is to provide science that will help the management. Our goal is the conservation of grasslands. And it doesn't matter if it's bison grazing or cattle grazing or other land use. So when you're thinking about that vast area, it's a tapestry of a working landscape and it has different parts. And we try to work with all of the parts, not just the bison in that area. And to try to provide as much information as we can to those land managers so they can make the best decisions for their lands and for all of us, right? Because we want to make sure that these species persist in the future. I want my kids to see them. I want them to be able to enjoy these areas too, just for, for us and for the future. So that's a great way to, to segue into your other project that we want to highlight is with the swift fox. Um, can you kind of give us the same kind of background? Like uh, it's a, it's a reintroduction process. So obviously they yeah. disappeared. <laughs> Can you tell us why uh, and then kind of go into uh, what a reintroduction program like this and really entails? So yes, yeah, Swift Fox are, you know, the entire program is very interesting, but we'll start a little bit about history of what happened to them. So they used to be quite common all over the Great Plains, Canada, all the way down to Texas. But then at the turn of the last century, you know, land use changes and predator control programs, rodent control programs changed everything for them. And they were reduced to less than 10% of in their range. And then the second half of the last century, they started to happen more conservation work in different parts. And slowly they recolonized part of their range in the Southern areas. And there was also a few reintroductions and then a bigger reintroduction up in Canada and two smaller reintroductions on the Fort Peck Reservation and Blackfeet Reservation. So now, today, they occupy about 40% of their historic range. But what hap what's happening now is that we have this pretty small northern population, which is mostly in Canada and then extending a little bit into Montana. And then the bulk of the range, Wyoming, all the way down to, to Texas. So we have a gap of about 300 miles between, between the northern portion and the southern portion. Ideally, we would want to see them connected. So this is part, part of what we're doing with this reintroduction is slowly starting to work to connect those populations. And then how did I get involved in this. Um, I wasn't planning to do this at all. It just kind of landed in my lap. Uh, on top of everything else, I was uh, approached by American Prairie and the Fort Belknap Indian community that started to work towards a reintroduction, started to put materials together for this reintroduction. And they asked Smithsonian, would you join this effort? Um, this is what we gathered so far. This is our game plan. What do you guys think? What do we need to do to make this happen? You, you know, the first thing that we really needed to do is just to make sure that swift foxes are really not in that region. We know that we have a northern population close to the border with Canada. We know that we have swift foxes down in the south. Hence, putting out thousands of cameras, no swift foxes couldn't find any evidence of them. Next step is like, why are they not there? What are the threats in the area? How is the habitat? Is it even suitable? Do they have enough food resources? Maybe something else is happening in that habitat that's limiting swift foxes from occupying that area. So there was a huge habitat assessment done for that entire region, not only for Fort Belknap, but also in the counties on the sides of to the east and to the west of Fort Belknap. So that was a year and a half process, habitat assessment, um, indicated that the habitat is suitable and that there's ample land for swift foxes. Great, check. Next, risk assessments. Mapping out everything that we could think about from the literature, interviewing experts, and following all the criteria in that IUCN guideline. Next step, population viability analysis, which is another process for modeling. And that is a really cool process where we take whatever we know about swift foxes from the literature in terms of their survival rates and production and 
So you run, you know, lots and lots of simulations and the model takes into account different things like the survival rate and reproduction rate and catastrophic events. And it will tell you that in 50 years, you have 90% success rate or in a hundred years, you would have a hundred percent success rate depending on the simulation. And we did all of that work and then we gathered our group of stakeholders. So it's not Smithsonian deciding to go forward with a reintroduction. It's first, first of all, the Fort Belknap community and their Fish and Wildlife Department and set of stakeholders from NGOs and experts with Fox experts, state, federal agency representatives. And we gathered in Lewistown for a two day workshop and the group needed to decide together if this seems like it's feasible. Can we go forward with this reintroduction, giving the money that we need to raise and the time that we need to invest? And the group decided to move forward. And then the group outlined also the protocol for the reintroduction. And then things started to move from there. So that's what, that, that is a, about two years worth of work. <laughs> I gotta say, we, we love rewilding reintroduction stories just because we know that there's two years to 20 years of research and work that's going into every single one. So as soon as you see that something's being reintroduced, it's like, oh, it's just like such a, being on the outside, not knowing all that backstory. It's just like, we, especially with an organization like Smithsonian, we, we know that you guys have done all that work. So it's, it means that so many things have gone right. And it's like, it's so awesome to see those things get reintroduced into the habit that they should be in. And especially for a species like the swift fox, because they're so cute. <laughs> you know, everyone <laughs> likes cute animals, obviously, and the bison, because they're big. And, um, you know, I would say predators, but predators get a lot of attention, whether they're, it's love or hate. Uh, and so that's such a great story of, of what it takes to reintroduce a species, or at least to start reintroducing a species. What is it about these two species and any native species that make them important enough to reintroduce or to conserve? Is, you know, we've essentially replaced the bison with cows. Um, and so what is it, and why is it important that a swift fox is in its entire range rather than just in, you know, Northern and South areas? Yeah, that's, that's a valid question. And it's a really hard question too. Um, why reintroduce swift fox? I get that all the time. Why are they important? They're gone, you know, the system continued without them, right? So for me, as an ecologist, I view the ecosystem as a network of links. And then suddenly you take out one link, you take out the swift fox. Let's look at what they eat. They eat insects, they eat rodents um, for the most part. So if they're in that landscape, obviously they are regulating those trophic levels under them. You take that link out, they're no longer there. Nobody's, you know, there is no other species that's going to fill in that, you know, link. So we do want to see the whole ecosystem together. We do want to see all of those links intact. And I do realize that it is not always possible, but when it is, I think that we should thrive for that. Um, if you talk to our Native American partners from the Nine Dakota tribes, when they talk about the reintroduction is the return of a family member, you know, making that circle full again, bringing back that missing link. It has meaning also for people's culture, for people's connections to their environment. So I think it goes even much wider than just looking at the ecosystem. When you, when you think about the communities that live around that area and Generally, if we put, you know, the ecology and ecosystem function aside, I think that swift fox, like you said, are super cute. That's a flax species. You know, I can't talk about bison with everybody in the area. I can certainly talk about swift fox with anyone, with anyone. So easy to bring people around one table to discuss things about this reintroduction, to work together in this reintroduction. I mean, we're working with about 15 different organizations, four different states. You know, we're getting foxes from Colorado and Wyoming and Kansas who've been so instrumental through this entire process. Montana Fish and Wildlife are helping. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service are helping. 
different reservations. Canada is helping. Like, you know, I'm interacting with 60 people weekly about this program, BLM, BIA, I, I, you know, I can't name everybody, the NGOs. So many people want to help the Swift Fox. Can you, I guess that's a good segue into uh, your, your partnerships with the local communities. Um, as you kind of mentioned, you've been working with a lot of different partners, fish and wildlife uh, agencies, uh, people in Canada, probably local communities. Uh, can you kind of highlight the, the work you've done with the local tribes? Sure. Um, so as I said before, I really work with professionals and experts, different NGOs, the ranching community. And I work with the Fort Dunlap Indian community, which is made up the nine Dakota tribes that live on those lands. And when I'm working with communities, I work on different levels. So it could be working, for example, with the Fort Belknap government, with the council, to try to pass resolutions about conservation of different species, to get their commitment to different projects, to hear about what they want to do on their lands. What is the next step for bison? What is the next step for swift fox? What do they inspire? What do they want to see in the future, right? So it's important to, to make sure that the, their government is involved. That is a very you know, high level, eagle's eye level. Work very closely with the Fish and Wildlife Department, which they oversee all the work on the reservation. They're wonderful and great to work with. And you know, all of our work is so collaborative. I need help, they come out, they need help, I come out. All the projects are developed together and we think about the goals together, the objectives together. And then there's the community and the community is also quite diverse. And we have to think about how do we distribute all that knowledge, all that information, um, tell people about the project. Cause it's really important to connect everybody to the work that you're doing. It's their lands, you know, they are reintroducing bison. They are reintroducing the swift fox. They also have black footed ferrets. It's their pride, they're champions in conservation and have been since the 1970s. And they take pride in that work. So it's important that we try to involve the different generations from elders, spiritual leaders. We work very closely with the United Dakota College, um, try to bring students out to see the work, develop different workshops with them, seminar series in educational materials. But we also try to work with smaller children, like inviting the high school to come to a, a release of swift foxes so they can actually see that animal. They might ne never see a swift fox, you know, until the population is actually established. Come see it with your own eyes. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how you say it in your own language. Let's talk, bring, you know, elders in so they can tell stories of what they remember. And then let's talk about the ecology. And also for smaller kids, it's been very challenging with COVID because we can't come into the schools and actually meet with the kids. So we've been working on different modules that we can send out to the schools where they can watch a video and then they can answer a worksheet. And then we try to do like meet the scientists, like a live meeting where people can actually, or children can actually come in and ask us questions about what we're doing. And we're hoping that um, maybe in the near future, we'll get some of, you know, normalcy in our life where we can actually go into those schools and meet those wonderful kids. I, I love what you, what you said there about uh, the diversity of stakeholders, because it's just like the, the grassland communities, you need the diversity of birds and insects and plants and everything, you know, the, the undulates and everything. And it's the same thing for uh, a conservation movement. You need everyone involved. And so with that said, there's the stereotypical or traditional clash between scientists and native cultures. I, I think that is, was true for so long, and I think it's definitely changing now. I think a lot of people, especially Smithsonian, are trying to get everyone involved so you know, there's no, there's no uh, mistakes made with, or less mistakes, there's always mistakes, <laughs> that's part of it. Um, with that said, what have you learned um, that you weren't expecting uh, when you were, when you signed on to this project? What have you learned from those communities that as an ecologist coming in, like that you weren't expecting? Yeah, so, so one 
to, to your point, there's always mistakes and we always make mistakes and then we try to do better. And really, you know, as a scientist, your way of thought is very linear, linear. You know, I have goals and I have research questions that I want to do and I know exactly what I need to do and I know exactly what I need to collect in the field to answer those questions. But then when you go and you work with communities, then it's not always that straightforward. And then when you work with communities, the way of thinking is very different than your, my way of thinking. And the connection and the way that they view things is very different than the way I view things. And I always have to be aware and sensitive and to always go back and ask and to learn more from them about traditional ways or about the stories or about questions that they have or how they want to, you know, tell the stories from the elders to the younger, to the younger generation. How do they want to be involved in the program, in the science? Or we just, you know, we have to find a balance between what I need to do, which is do research and write academic papers. But at the same time, think about what are the needs of the community in terms of their culture and do my best to help support that and to hear from them what they need for things to happen the way that they want them to happen. So it's, for me, it's just a lot of patience and a lot of, to understand that things move at a different time frame. And the way that people do things is very different than me. So it's a very, you know, personal growth, I would say. You had mentioned that your job as a scientist with the bison is to collect data for land managers or other folks, advocates to make decisions. But that seems very different than your work with the swift fox. It sounds like, yes, you're getting data, but you're actually doing the rewilding. Um, how does that interact with you? How does that that responsibility um, and the different responsibilities in both those projects play out for you? You know, I, I'm leading this project. So I always have to check myself. I always have to think about the multiple partners. Like I said, I interact with about 60 people every week about this project, which is insane. And you, and I need to hear everybody and I need to make sure that everybody's good with the project. So there's a lot of pressure to make sure that everything that we do, we do in a good way, that everybody is happy and you try to make all of the people around you happy. It's not easy. People are complicated. Um, and as a scientist though, I'm using this reintroduction, you know, the Swift Fox reintroduction to learn about, you know, this species colonization and how they're, you know, we have this really cool natural experiment where we're bringing back foxes. We're trapping foxes from the wild, from robust populations in Wyoming and then in Colorado and then in Kansas. So it's along this climate gradient and we're bringing them back to Montana up north. So these really cool ecological questions about what happens you know, to each of those cohorts as we're moving them up north you know, looking at the differences between them and how that would impact the survival and impact the success of the reintroduction and thinking about how they mix in terms of their genetics, how well do they reproduce. We're looking at the fox's personality to see if that impacts survival rates. We're looking at their hormone levels, both stress and both thyroid hormones to learn about their nutritional state before they move and then after we move them to Montana. Each fox is getting a GPS color. We're learning about their movement and their resource selection. And we're going to be doing a lot of genetics. So to see, you know, how the founders are actually mixing, reproducing, and also trying to see, you know, in some areas collecting also DNA from coyotes to try to see how densities of coyotes are impacting the swift foxes. There's so many things in ecological questions that we're gonna be answering with a student, a PhD student from Clemson University and another master's student from George Mason University. And 
multiple scientists from Smithsonian. So it is, you know, we're six scientists just from Smithsonian. It's a huge project. So in terms of the ecological questions and the science that is going into this reintroduction, it's pretty big. And then there's the actual reintroduction. We better succeed. We're putting in a lot, a lot of effort into it. There's this, I can't see any other way, but we do check ourselves after every step and sit down and think about what worked, what didn't work, and how can we make this better? It reminds me of a conversation that I had with a friend of mine who's a theoretical physicist, and he was describing his work in the theory. And then he was talking about applied physics and how they're different. And when I was thinking about that, I was like, you know, a conservationist has to be both. <laughs> they have to be the theoretical and they have to be the applied. And mm -hmm. even when we're just doing theory, we're still taking into account the applied because otherwise, what are we doing? But then when we're doing the applied, we absolutely have to think through the theories and think through the data. And so we don't have the luxury of separating ourselves so cleanly. And you're the one that's experiencing that, like you said, with that responsibility to do both at the same time. Yeah, but that's what makes it fun, right? Because then you feel that what you're doing actually has a huge impact. So you're not living in your own bubble. It's like, it's not my own research. I'm not alone in the world. I'm working with so many people. And I hope that this work also impacts those people. So in a good way. So. That's amazing because it is, it is that impact, the real world impact. But at the end of the day, you're just getting data regardless because um, you yeah. are being a scientist and it's going to be a positive or a negative or positive and negative doesn't even apply sometimes. It's just data. All right, what do we do with that? One of the thoughts that's coming up to me right now is, um, do you mind imagining that We've got a bunch of third graders listening and describe to us a uh, uh, swift fox, the normal day of a swift fox that either you're, you're rewilding or what, what is a swift fox and how are they going through, their, going through their day? Sure. Yeah, I'll try to imagine like I'm talking to my kids. <laughs> it should be, I hope I do this well. Maybe, maybe I talk to my kids differently, but we'll see. <laughs> swift foxes are the smallest can eat species, dog-like species in continental North America. They weigh about five pounds, and that is even smaller than your cat. So if you have a cat in home, a swift fox is smaller. Um, they're beautiful, tannish color. They have a really, really long tail, and that has a black tip. And that would be different than red foxes that we often see by our houses that actually have white tips on, on their tail. Um, they have beautiful eyeliner around their eyes and um, these black patches on their muzzle and their stomach and the under chin is white. And they're really beautiful and elegant. And when you track them, I don't know anybody that worked with carnivores. So usually when you trap a carnivore, even a small one like a red fox, you would anesthetize it to handle it because they would try to bite your face off if you do something else. Swift fox are so timid that you can actually take them out of the trap. They don't fight you too much. You can just like hold them down, do the health check, put your GPS collar on them, and just put them back in the kennel before you transport them to for the translocation process, which is really cool. They, they're also, that means that the male and the female are a pair for life, which is also, I think is pretty cool. And both parents take care of the kids. They're also um, reliant on dents the entire year. So other species might use dents only when they have kids or babies, but swift foxes need dents year round because they use those dens to escape from different predators. They're swift foxes, so they run really fast, like 40 miles per hour fast. And they need to live in places where they have a bunch of escape terrain. And that means a lot of holes in the ground where they you know, spot a coyote and they can just zoom into the next closest hole and just dive in. It kind of looks like you know a cartoon character that's like diving into a hole. It's pretty cool to see that. Because they're so small, 
So, you know, a lot of people are scared, you know, and, and they ask us when we, when we talk about the reintroduction, will they come and eat my chickens or will they hurt my cats or something? So they're so small and their prey items are so very small as well. These guys, you know, eat a lot of grasshoppers. Now, you know, when you take apart their poo, that is full of grasshoppers. They like rodents too, so small rodents. And then sometimes they would catch bigger ones like prairie dogs as well. But that makes a bulk of their diet. So insects and then the rodents. For the reintroduction, what we're seeing about their movement is absolutely insane. You can release them in a site and when they start going and exploring areas, they can move 50 to 100 miles away from the release sites and just wander all over the place until they actually find the best area to settle in where they want to establish a den, which I think is also pretty remarkable for such a small species to move so much. I have to say they sound like an amazing species and they sound like they have the, the, the benefit or the luxury of being, you know, a charismatic megafauna that they're cute. Everyone likes them and they're, they're not taking livestock. They're not. And so it, it's just like this perfect, uh, it seems like a perfect species to reintroduce. And even then you still had years and years and years of research to get it right. So uh, yeah. it, it sounds so cool. And what you were saying earlier about the reintroduce uh, introduction uh, process and how it actually happens and like the taking the theory and then the practical I've been a part of a few reintroduction programs um, with you know burrowing owls or we did an episode on condors but more specifically that we have a local butterfly species that we released on this preserve that I uh, you know I'm the biologist for and it's so nerve-wracking <laughs> you know it, and even like because it's got to be it's way different from you know fox or burrowing owl but you're releasing thousands of these butterflies and you know 90% of them will be dead in the next 48 hours because and hopefully a couple will will link together and, and lay some eggs in the next seven days that they only live for seven days anyway but just to have like all this process and all these meetings endless especially now endless zoom meetings and then you're just like okay we'll just let it go it's just like ugh, this is mind-blowing and it's got to be the same when you're like okay well we have this fox and go. <laughs> Good luck, little guy. <laughs> exactly. Good luck. And, and we know that not all of them survive. You know, they have a high mortality rate as is. And, you know, we do the reintroduction when we go and we do the trapping, we do it in a certain time of the year. So we do it when the kids start to disperse. And then you translocate them at the time when dispersal is actually happening. So we're trying to time it in a way that is makes sense in terms of their biology as well. But then you know that when you're releasing them, you're taking them away from their home, you're moving them to a new location. We try to move family groups together. So, you know, if we catch a few kids in a certain location, they would be released together. If we capture a pair, male and female, they would be released together to maybe help the stress of that movement from from one habitat to another but it is nerve-wracking you know you want them to succeed and you don't know you don't know how things will end up and you and there's so many things that could go wrong will the technology hold will the gps colors actually work so we know where they are will we find you know dens that were established next year hopefully can we monitor them in a good way so yeah, it's constant worry, but you know, at the end of the day, all you have to do is push through and hope that you know you did your homework and you're doing everything right and learn from your mistakes and correct them. So the next step would be better. And then the next step after that would be much better as well. And last year we did, we did find a den. It wasn't easy because the GPS colors don't last a whole year. So when it comes to, you know, when the kids emerge from the den, we didn't have any GPS locations from the individuals that we did this last year. That was the first year of the project. But then we found a den that had four kids. And then somebody also reported about another den that they found. So we know that there's a, we're successful and we know that they're starting to reproduce. 
And that's what you want, right? At the end of the day, that's what you want to see. And this year we did a big trapping session with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and all you know the numerous staffs that they brought down to help us with the trapping. And we translocated 30 individuals. And this Saturday, I'm going back to Wyoming to trap about 50 more individuals from Wyoming and bring them back north. So I'll talk about trends maybe in maybe next year or the year after, because we'll know a lot more. So right after we're done with the releases this year, we're starting this very big camera trap and scent post um, survey. It's gonna be about three months where we sample hundreds of locations. Swift foxes do this really, uh, this really cool behavior that if you put a scent post, they would go and coo next to it. So they would leave their scats next to these scent posts. And that scat is our gold. We want those scats. From that scat, we know DNA. So we know if it's a founder or a kit of a founder, we can start building the pedigree. We can start seeing who's breeding with whom. We also are getting the hormone analysis from those scats to know how stressed our foxes are. We are also learning about their nutritional state. Are they eating well? Are they doing good? And we can also do DNA barcoding on those scats to know what exactly are they eating on Ford Belknap and how is that different than what they had available for them in their um, previous habitat, their previous home. So that's happening throughout the uh, you know fall to the beginning of winter and then come spring we start searching for dens again and hoping to be successful so year three or year four of the program we'll know a lot more right now it's kind of early hearing you talk about all the different projects and different aspects of each project i don't i don't know how you do it <laughs> and again this is why we wanted to start this program is or these these series is because you guys are like literal superheroes where you're just spending i don't even again you have two kids you said right so how are you have how do you have a, a, a home life and how do you have how are you able to do this and so i think that's a great uh, segue into you know uh, individual reflection mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that you have done work previously in the in the Middle East. And I don't know if this was one of the questions that you were going to ask next, Austin, but I'm just very interested. And I think our audience would be very interested in knowing how you became a landscape ecologist, how you became a conservation biologist. Like what is your history to get you to the point where you are the superhero that we see today? Yeah, I don't know if I'm a superhero. I'm just a person. <laughs> I don't know. So I'm Israeli and I was born in Israel and lived there my entire life. And it seems like that people are, are expecting this, you know, life-changing event or something that happened when you were a kid. And I can't say that anything, you know, special happened. I guess I was born this way, you know. I love my surrounding. I've always loved animals. My poor parents had to suffer of me bringing all these strays and things back to our home always. Um, and I always knew that this is something that I wanted to do with my life. And I guess I was sure that it's going to happen and it did happen. Um, I'm very curious on how things around me work and I just want to figure them out and I enjoy my research. And I also, if I didn't love my work, because the work is hard. As a conservationist, I don't have to tell you to. It's hard work. It doesn't always work. And successes are few. But I love my work. I really love it. I love waking up and working on it. I love working with people. And I love working with the wildlife. And I love the statistics. And I love the writing. And I love the podcasts. So every part of it. And it's not to say that it's not hard but I enjoy it and I feel that I'm doing something that's meaningful and I can't imagine doing anything else, I guess. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's funny because there's, I, we get the same kind of questions. It's like, well, why did you choose to go to do that? Because it doesn't, for people that aren't into this, it doesn't really make sense. There has to be some reason behind it. 
And, you know, over the, over time you kind of figure out like, all right, well, maybe I watched the crocodile hunter or something. And you kind of just like assign these things to like, this is why I do this. But in the end, it's kind of like, like you said, you kind of feel like you were going to do it anyway. (laughs) It's it's, it's what you wanted to do. And whether or not you watched Jeff Corwin grab a a toad or not, you probably were going to, you know, head this direction. And so that's a great segue into the, the next kind of idea of this, of the idea of optimism in conservation or possibilism specific to this program. Um, and I, so much of it is that you, you want to do it, but I can imagine that on a day-to-day basis, as you said, it can get difficult. So how do you keep the, the optimism or the possibilism, at least in the back of your head, while you're going through these, these programs that are, have such high stakes? First, you know, you always have to be optimistic. You have to in this line of work. There's like, there's no other choice. You have to always look forward because there's so many obstacles and so many hurdles and you have to be creative and flexible all the time. You know, you go out and you have this mission. You're trying to do this research or you're trying to understand and answer a question. And you know that to get to your end goal, there's infinite, you know, trajectories that you can get get to your goal. And you start with one path and that doesn't work. So you have to be creative and think about how do you diverge to a different path? Because you know what the end game is and you have to get to it. And if you're not optimistic and if you're not positive about the work that you're doing, then it would be so easy to say, okay, I give up. I tried 10 different things and I'm done. You also have to know when to give up. That's important too. But I think as long as the the project moves forward and you find a way to move it forward in a way that takes into account all, all the needs of your numerous partners and you do it in a transparent and in a good way, then that really helps. And being optimistic about it is a huge part. Because if you're not, you know, I wouldn't do this job, you know, if, if, if you're feeling failure all the time, then you probably wouldn't be here. It almost seems from the outside view, from somebody that's just listening to the doom and gloom stories, it almost seems counterintuitive. You would think that somebody that's the technician that's doing this work would just be kind of um, frustrated and, and doing that, but that's not what we found. We found, you know, in talking to so many different conservationists, it's a different perspective than I think the non-conservation professional has, um, about being frustrated and maybe even depressed about the environmental world. Um, so it's just, it's just something that we've noticed that a lot of conservationists that we've talked to are genuinely optimistic Um, everything from Dr. Uh, John Paul Rodriguez is saying, you know, I, I am optimistic. I see the world going in a good way. Um, and so just trying to make that make sense. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Um, because we're trying to figure that out as well. I don't know if the world is going in the right way. Um, but I am optimistic that we can make it go in the right way and we can find ways to be better. And if we decide to give up, you know, climate change, world is doomed. Why do I have kids? You know, questions that come up. Um, But you do realize that, you know, we're people and we want to live and we want to have a life and we want to move forward and we want to see the next generation and the next generation, right? I want to see my grandkids and the grandkids of my grandkids having a good place to live in. So you always move forward. Maybe you just have to find a way to make life work. And that's, for me, that's the optimism, whether it's a short-term you know, project, how do I move that forward? And when I think about my life and my kids and what I hope for them, And I hope they also find a way to move forward and to think about how to be better and how to make people's lives better. You know, you have this sense of optimism or possibilism as we're calling it um, about your work. And if people can hear that and, or watch that in you, 
that don't have a whole lot involved with conservation, maybe they can start to take that mindset into their own lives, whether it is through conservation or whatever they're doing. And I think that that idea can spread really well. You know, how, how can people that are listening, watching, uh, get involved, uh, whether they're in Montana or they're in Israel or wherever they are, um, how can they get involved either with your projects or just in general? One, if anybody's interested in the project that Smithsonian is doing in the region, then uh, just go online to the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. And there's a bunch of blogs that we put up uh, that we talk about just at everyday work and what we're doing. And you can reach out either to me or my colleague, Amy Boyce, who's our avian ecologist, or to talk with some of my students. Um, and there's always opportunities. We always open up, you know, internships or grad student positions. If you want to be part of our stakeholder groups on different projects, um, then people are invited. We try to be as inclusive as we can. Like I, you've probably noticed, I have no problem working with many, many people. Um, and I am always happy to talk about any project that I'm doing, and I'm always open to more collaborations. The idea is, is to grow the network and Smithsonian is, you know, champions really, I think I look at my other colleagues as well in different parts of the world, really great in convening different people and bringing them together to work on projects. And that's what I do here too. So there's me, the researcher trying to answer questions that I'm interested in. And then there's me, the person that's working with all of these stakeholders to try to answer questions that are relevant to these groups and meaningful for these people. So come and join, ask me questions. Yeah, we're so thankful that you exist, people like you exist, because Montana is such an amazing place. Like I said, I've always wanted to go, and maybe we'll, that'll be a, how we, uh, uh, that's our excuse, is we'll come visit you as a follow-up in a few years and, you know, come yeah. see the swift fox yeah. just all over the place, just like, there'll be like a new place in people's backyards and stuff. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing your stories um, and for all the work you're doing. And yeah, it's really is amazing how much you're able to, to get done and what you're able to do. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you so much to Gila for taking the time to talk with us and to the whole Smithsonian team and their partners for the work that they're doing in so many places. If you're in one of their work areas, please look into volunteering and any conservation effort could use the help. Hosts and producers for this episode are Austin and Taylor Parker. Producers are Kat Coots and Andrea Santi. Music was provided by A Picture Book Studios. Please like, comment, and subscribe to our page if you haven't already. And thank you again for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.